Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series. Um, our first uh, webinar this semester uh, featuring international speaker, uh, we will have uh, Professor Wang Shaoda from University of Chicago. Um, he will present his uh, latest uh, working progress, citizen participation and government accountability, national scale experimental evidence from from pollution appeals in China. I believe that for those uh, participants who have registered for this talk, uh, you should have received um, the draft paper. And um, and we uh, let me first briefly introduce Professor Wang. He's an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Um, he is an applied economist with research interest in development economics, environmental economics, and political economy. Um, and um, his main research agenda aims at understanding the political economy of public policy with a regional focus on China. He graduated from Peking University and he received a PhD from UC Berkeley. Um, now we have two uh, wonderful discussants today, both from our law school. Uh, first, we have uh, Ying Xia from, um, she's an assistant professor at, the, at our law department. Um, she graduated from Harvard Law School. And, um, and her doctoral thesis focused on the social legal implication of Chinese investment in African countries. Um, she, um, she graduated um, and received her LM and LB from Peking University. Her research interests include environmental law, international law, and law and policy with a particular focus uh, on experience from developing countries. Uh, our other um, discussant is uh, Professor John Liu, um, an associate professor at the University of Hong Kong Department of Law. Um, his main research focus include um, the role of courts and judicial behavior, um, as well as law and development. Um, he um, has applied uh, methods, interdisciplinary methods of data science and economics to study many of these topics. Um, and um, for those uh, students who probably will be familiar with his work and, and his courses on AI, on uh, judicial experiments. Um, so um, we are very fortunate to have these two wonderful discussants to join us today. And um, uh, we will also have time for the audience to ask questions. And so please feel free to uh, leave your questions in the chat box or, or just raise your hand. Uh, I, I, can, uh, I can let you directly ask the question. So without further ado, uh, let, me uh, let, me, uh, let me give the floor to uh, Professor Wang. Okay, uh, thanks so much. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks so much for having me and thanks in advance for uh, discussions. Uh, so I'm an economist with some interest in law and law enforcement. So really look forward uh, to your comments. So uh, the topic I'm going to present today is citizen participation and government accountability, national scale experimental evidence from pollution appeals in China. So the motivation behind this project is that you know, across globe, we see billions of people living under extreme levels of pollution and that has severe negative consequences on house outcomes labor productivity and residential welfare. But at the same time, if we want to regulate those large polluting firms, that typically imposes heavy costs on the local economies, which means that in the absence of enough public pressure, the governments typically don't have enough incentives to, exist, uh, to uh, strictly enforce those existing environmental laws. And that's reflected by the fact that there exists a widespread failure of countries to achieve compliance, even with their own environmental standards. And more specifically, if you look at those very detailed firm level emissions data collected and publicized by many governments, in those data, there often exists clear pollution violations that despite being explicitly reflected by the government's own data, these violations remain unregulated for extended periods of time. And so what we try to ask in this paper is that, you know, as citizens, is there anything we can do to hold the regulators accountable in enforcing environmental standards? And to answer that question, we conduct a national scale field experiment in China 
which is the largest polluter and the largest manufacturer in the world today. And this experiment will mainly involve uh, three different steps. So in the first step, we focus on China's continuous emissions monitoring system, SIMS. So this is a very large pollution monitoring network that covers the 25,000 largest polluting plants in China. And this network basically puts automatic monitors inside the pipes of each polluting plant. And those automatic monitors will collect in real time high frequency emissions data from each of these polluting plants. And so those 25,000 plants, by the way, they cover more than 75% of China's total industrial emissions. So it's the largest pollution monitoring network in the world. And so when the government collects this real-time emissions data, they publicize it every hour on the government website to all the internet users. And so what we do with the, uh, the this system is that from the government publicized SIMS data, we can identify in real time which firms are currently violating the national emission standards. And then once we have identified these ongoing pollution violations, in the second step, we randomly intervene against those violations. So we recruited a group of citizen environmental volunteers from a large uh, uh, environmental NGO in China. And then we randomly instructed these citizen volunteers to file pollution appeals against these ongoing pollution violations as reflected by the same state. So basically, the citizens can appeal to either the local regulator or to the polluting firm itself. They can do so privately through phone calls or government websites, or they can do so publicly on social media. So by social media, here we mean Weibo, which is a, a Chinese version of Twitter with 500 million users uh, in China. And after we make these different types of pollution appeals, in the third step, we just follow up to see what happens to the government's regulatory behavior and what happens to the firm's emission and abatement activities. And in the paper, we have three main findings. So first we find that publicly appealing against pollution violations could significantly improve environmental compliance. So specifically, if a firm was put under the public pollution appeals arm, meaning that whenever this firm commits a pollution violation, we're going to publicly appeal to the local regulator on Weibo. So if that is the case, then during our eight months experimental period, this firm will be 40% less likely to commit a pollution violation. And that translates into a 13% drop in its air emissions and a 4% drop in its water emissions. So there are huge environmental returns to public pollution appeals. And in contrast, if we make private pollution appeals, either to the local regulator or to the firm itself, even if we use the same information, same format, same language as we used in the public appeals, these private appeals only lead to marginal improvements in environmental outcomes. Right? So the contrast between the public versus private appeals tells us that the publicity of a pollution appeal is actually key to its effectiveness. And then in the paper, we try to understand you know, why does publicity matter so much? And in the paper, we proposed several different hypotheses, but I've, our, our, our evidence suggests that you know, the main reason why publicity matters is that publicity can incentivize the government to exert more efforts in regulation enforcement. So what we find in the paper is that, you know, for those different Weibo appeals that we found, we randomly selected half of them to add additional publicity to them, to make them more visible by adding additional likes and retweets to those posts, right? so that these posts randomly become more visible to other Weibo users. And we found that once the Weibo post randomly becomes more visible to other Weibo users, the government is significantly more likely to formally respond to that appeal. And conditional responding, they're also more likely to conduct on-site investigations trying to resolve that pollution appeal. And so basically publicity incentivized the government to better enforce the, the regulation. And finally, in the paper, we try to understand the spillover effect or the general equilibrium effect of our interventions. So basically, we were worried about the potential of a negative spillover effect in the following sense. Right, so if we appealed against a subset of firms' pollution violations, 
then maybe all the regulatory attentions will be focused on this subset of firms. And those other non-appealed firms might be allowed to pollute even more and no one will regulate them. But if that is the case, then the treated firms will be cleaner, but the control firms will be dirtier. So there is a negative spillover effect. So to see whether that's the case, in the paper, when we do the randomization, we have a double randomization design. So in addition to randomizing different types of appeals at the firm level, we also cross-randomized the intensity of treatment at the city level. So in some cities, we have more firms being treated by our appeals. In some cities, we have fewer firms being treated by our appeals. And then we can compare the control firms across the high versus low intensity regions. But because the control firms did not directly receive any treatment themselves, the difference between these two control groups could highlight the spillover effect that they receive from their peers getting treated. And by doing that analysis, we found that there is no negative spillover effect. If anything, there is a very noisy but potentially positive spillover effect, meaning that you know, when my peers get treated, even if no one is appealing about me, I'm also going to get cleaner. It could be that you know, the government, in response to increased amount of appeals, they just increased regulation enforcement across the board for everyone. OK, so that's the main idea of this paper. So uh, in the remainder of the talk, I'll quickly explain to you the institutional background. Then I'll talk about how we designed and implemented the experiment. And then I'll talk about the empirical results. And finally, I'll conclude. So basically, uh, the continuous emissions monitoring system in China, this was part of China's very ambitious war on pollution. So it was formally launched in 2013 in order to reduce the information gaps between the regulators, the firms, and the citizens. So this uh, system covers the 25,000 largest polluting plants in the country. And altogether, those 25,000 plants, they account for more than 75% of the total industrial emissions in China. So this is by far the largest pollution monitoring network globally. And what uh, the SIMS does is that it puts these automatic monitors inside the pipes of each polluting plant. And these automatic monitors can collect real-time emissions data for different types of pollutants. And that data will be transmitted to the government and the government will publicize it every hour on the internet. And the central government follows a very strict protocol to ensure that the SIMS data cannot be influenced or manipulated by the local guys. So for example, when the SIMS monitors were installed, the installation cannot be conducted by the local government or by the firm itself. Instead, the central government directly sends technicians to the firm to install the monitor to make sure that it's put in the right spot, it's running properly. And once the monitors are up and running, there will be cameras installed around the monitors that run 24 seven to make sure that no one can physically twist the pipe or twist the monitor. And then, you know, once the data is collected and provided to the government, the government applies a series of different algorithms trying to detect potential anomalies in the data to make sure that you know, if there's an anomaly, we need to hold a video conference to, to figure out you know, what is going on with the data. And finally, in many regions that we conducted field works in, we found that they even use additional novel environmental technologies to further uh, eliminate the chance of data manipulation. So for example, a very interesting technology that we uh, encountered in the field was that they would put a small machine next to the monitor installed by the government. And then this small machine can choose a random time to release a unit of gas with random components. So the idea is that you know, whatever the local gas might do to manipulate the data, to the extent that these random guys that I randomly released did not show up in my eventual reading, then I know that something funny happened throughout this process. And the central government can just punish the local guys based on that alone. And so basically the combination of these different protocols makes it e extremely unlikely for the local guys to be able to manipulate the same state. Uh, Shalda, can I interrupt and ask one quick question here? So um, what is the standard to determine somebody have violated um, um, the environmental law? I mean, since this emission standard is tracked hourly, right? And then, yes. so what, what exactly the standard? I mean, is a violation once or a violation for a consistent period of time for several days? Or, and then how did you guys decide if somebody has violated? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. So basically the environmental law requires that a pollution violation is defined based on your average emission concentration in a 24 hour period exceeding the national standard. And the national standard is firm specific for those large SIMS plants. So each firm faces its own standard. And if your emission concentration in a 24 hour period is higher than that standard, then you are committing a violation. And we're following the exact same uh, definition as the government when we conduct the experiment. Right, so when you collect those samples of those violators, um, I guess there are some which violate all the time, some that violate only occasionally. I mean, do you randomize among them? Yes, because it's randomized. So like the, the, the uh, ratio of frequent violators and you know rare violators, they, they're the same across those different arms. But what we found is that, you know, when we try to look at the hydrogenity with respect to their baseline violation rate, most of the results will be driven by the frequent violators. So basically the person who would have violated you know, 20 times during the eight months, now they violate like three times. And after being reported twice, you know, they just stopped doing that afterwards. So those guys drive a lot of, those, uh, a lot of the results that we, we find in the paper. Okay, so once the data is uh, transmitted to the government, it will be publicized on a provincial SIEMS platform. So here is a screenshot from one such platform. So here we can see the name of the province the firm that's being monitored and what uh, pollutant is being monitored, what's the time of data disclosure, so once every hour, and we can see the monitored emission concentration that hour, we can see the government limit for emission concentration for that firm and the status of the firm, meaning whether it's violating or complying with the uh, emission standard. And this information exists in every hour for every one of those 25,000 large polluting plants and you know, for for uh, for and this is available to every citizen that uses uh, the internet. Okay, so given this information, you know, we designed uh, our field experiment. So the main experimental intervention uh, is randomized at the firm level. So basically, we randomized the twenty five thousand seams uh, large plants into three broadly defined experimental groups. Okay, so the first group is a control group. So if a firm is assigned uh, to the control group, then you know when this firm commits a pollution violation, we're not going to do anything about it. Yeah, so that's a pure control arm. And then we have a private appeals arm, T1. So what we do here is that if a firm in T1 commits a pollution violation, we're going to privately appeal against the violation. And we can do so in several different ways. So in some, for some firms, you know, we can privately appeal by sending a private message to the official Weibo account of the local regulator, or we can, you know, send a private message to the government's appeal website, or, you know, we can make a phone call to the government's hotline to appeal, or we can call the firm itself to appeal. And, you know, we cross randomize these arms. So for a subset of firms, we, we did both. We call the firm and we call the government to see whether this common knowledge between the firm and the government would create any additional response. But the common feature across T1, A, B, C, D is that they're all private in the sense that you know, across all those arms, only the person who files the appeal, so our citizen volunteer, and the person who receives the appeal, so either the firm or the local regulator, so only we can see this information. And no other internet users can see this information. So they're all private appeals in that sense. And in contrast, in T2, we conduct public appeals. So if a firm in T2 commits a pollution violation, we are going to publicly complain to the local regulator on Weibo. So basically we write a Weibo post and publicize it so everyone can see it. And when we make those public Weibo appeals, we have a cross randomization. So generally for half of the Weibo posts that we, we make, where we add additional likes and retweets to those posts to make them more visible to other Weibo users. And we see how the government responds differently to the less visible versus more visible uh, Weibo appeals. Yeah, there's a question. So uh, when I'm looking at the design of the public appeals, I want, I just wonder why uh, why not randomize? So why not like uh, give some variation of the uh, the intensity of the treatment in the private appeals? Because you can have one uh, citizen appealing to the government. You can have two, you can have three, right? So yeah. now basically the main finding is that private appeals does not uh, do not work, but public appeals does uh, do work. But what about the intensity of 
uh, private appeals, right? So uh, what about 10 appeals at the same time? Does it, uh, is it equal to the effect of public appeal? Something like that. So have you considered that when, when you design the experiment? No, so that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So basically I think the question is that, you know, if in the private appeals, we privately appeal like 10 times, you know, whether that will be as effective as a public appeal. Yeah. So we thought a lot about this. Uh, eventually we decided not to do it basically because I think at some point, the boundary between private and public is no longer clear. Right? So if you have two people file the appeal, maybe you can call it private, but if you have 20 people simultaneously filing an appeal, it seems very organized. Right? So, so that's one reason you know, conceptually it becomes blurred the boundary. But also a practical reason is that you know, we actually have access to the universe of pollution appeals naturally filed by citizens outside of our experiment. So we looked at that data and we found that you know, there is not a very strong dose response function. So like, you know, if you add additional person, so in some cases, you know, two people, three people are filing and compared to one person filing, we didn't see a huge difference there. So we also didn't expect that, you know, if you add a few more people, there will be a response. So then you know, we, we didn't do that in this case, but you know, it's a very uh, you know, reasonable question and we, we gave it a lot of thought. Yeah, okay, so that's the experimental design. So very quickly, let me show you how we implemented uh, the experiment. So in T1A, we file private appeals on Weibo. So what we do is that we log on to Weibo using our citizen volunteers account. We fund the official account of the local regulator. So each local regulator is required by the government to host a Weibo account to respond to the citizen feedback. And so we find that local regulators Weibo, and we send him a private message saying that, you know, from the same state that we observed this firm is committing a pollution violation on this day, we send him a screenshot showing the pollution violation and we ask him to do something about it. And since it is, this is a private message, you know, no other people can see it. And similarly, you know, we can file this message on the government's website so the government hosts this uh, appeal website that directly uh, facilitates this type of uh, private appeals. So we write to the government the same information from the same state that we see this violation. We, we upload a screenshot and we ask the government to do something about it. And similarly, you know, we can make phone calls you know, to the government or to the uh, firm itself. So basically, you know, we follow the same transcript as before. And you know, here we can no longer send a uh, screenshot because it's a phone call. So we ask the uh, volunteers to look at the SIMS website and verbally describe you know, what they see from this website. But throughout T1, A, B, C, D, all those things are private. And then in public appeals, we ask our citizen volunteer to log on to his personal account and he writes the same content you know, from the SIMS data. We see this firm is committing this violation. We upload a screenshot we ask the government to do something about it, and then we add the official account of the local regulator. And when we publicize it, we can make sure that you know they can notice because we added uh, their account. And then randomly for half of the Weibo posts, we ask our citizen volunteers to add additional likes and retweets to those posts to make them more visible. So if we don't add, so, so we ask them to add 10 additional likes and 10 additional retweets on average. So if we don't add it on average, the Weibo post naturally gather about one like and one retweet. So basically it's not something hugely popular or you know, trendy topic. So when we add 10 additional likes and 10 additional retweets, it will become much more visible from the government's perspective. Right, can we show that? So the, your point is that it actually didn't get much attention. This kind mm -hmm. of public appeals actually attracted quite very limited public attention, maybe except from the regulator itself, right? Yeah, so, so basically the type of violation that we focus on are like the day-to-day -day very common violations where your emission standards, your emissions exceeded the standards by like 30%. It's not like the headline, you know, scandal pollution, so that type of, you know, things that can make to the trendy topic. This is like, you know, thousands of such emissions happen every day in the data. So, you know, it's not something that can naturally become a trendy topic. But what we find in the data is that even if we don't add this additional publicity, so even if the, the post just naturally gathers like one like, it actually still makes the government more responsive than a private appeal. So basically there's something generic about, you know, this can be seen by others, even if it's not being seen by others, but the, the fact that it could potentially be seen by many others creates a effect in itself. Yeah. 
Right, I mean, that actually uh, strengthened your story about um, this is this is the government being more responsive as a consequence of this kind of notice from citizens, rather than it was because of shaming of the companies uh, that have driven this effect, right? I mean, because when you talk about publicity, naturally people were thinking about, was it the shaming that was, you know, make the farms more, com you know, more compliant? Um, <laughs> But if, if you if you explain more in your paper, you know, actually the the um, public attention is actually very limited, especially in the Internet, like, you know, uh, like on Weibo, right? I mean, so it's mostly the effect of publicly notifying the agency. Um, I guess the agency know about it anyway, except that now you left a, a trace in the public that somebody mm -hmm. have notified him. So that exert pressure. On the regulator to act, right? I mean, exactly, and also a potential for those for this to blow up. So even if it hasn't blown up yet, right, no one is reading it. But the fact that it's on Weibo, if you don't do anything about it, you know, it might blow up later on. So I think that potential also deters the government from not acting on this. So let me say one thing about the the corporate social responsibility point uh, that you raised. So you know, in the paper, we try to think about this, and one task we can do is that you know, we can look at you know, the firms that produce intermediate goods and the firms that produce final consumer goods. So to the extent that, you know, the firms that produce final consumer goods will care more about corporate social responsibility than the firms that produce, you know, intermediate goods, then, you know, we should see them respond stronger and more strongly to the interventions if this is a story about, you know, firms being, being shamed publicly. But we actually didn't see that. So we actually see the opposite. So basically, you know, it's not about, you know, the firms worrying about their image among the public. It's more about the government worrying about its image among the public. And what about whether those firms are publicly listed or not? Yeah, so we, we tried that, but there are like too few firms that are publicly listed. So, and you know, they're very different from the, the ones that are not publicly listed. So, so it's not very comparable, but you know, we could potentially do that as well. And one more thing you can maybe look at is to consider maybe corruption level at the local region. Because one mm -hmm. of the things that you, once you left a trace in the public, um, the government authority doesn't want to be, if they, their, in, uh, their inertia might be, you know, considered as corruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. may, maybe that's something interesting too. Yeah, that, that's a good sense. Um, Yingxia, you want to ask something? I just have a very quick clarification, uh, clarification question on this data. So in the paper, you mentioned that you collaborated with a social media firm to add these randomized likes and retweets. And I wonder, are the, uh, this is this firm operating like active Weibo accounts owned by real people or are they just zombie accounts? Just to, just yeah, so, so we're, yeah, so no, that's a good question. So we actually did both. So we, uh, part of those additional likes and retweets were added by the social media promotion company. And part of this was given by our own uh, citizen volunteers. So they use their own accounts to add likes and retweets. So when we use the social media promotion company, so you can think of the company that, you know, boosts those, uh, you know, uh, rock stars or movie stars to put them on, on the trendy list. And so that's like their day job. And this is like, you know, their, their sidekick by doing this for us. And so basically what those companies do, is they're very professional. They keep like thousands of accounts that are fake, but look extremely real. So you wouldn't be able to tell it's a fake account. They post like daily stuff, food, you know, traveling and stuff. It looks like a real person, but it's actually like all, you know, fake accounts cultivated by the company to, to provide the Latin tweets and the Weibo bots will not detect it as, you know, a fake like, yeah. Do you, do you have the data of the wheels? Uh, the clicks or the, the reading, how many people read this post? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I, I need to check with the, with the volunteers. Yeah, yeah, to see. yeah, you do have like likes and comments data, right? Are you, um... yeah, does Weibo still have views? I remember like several years ago it had, but my Weibo account got yeah, yeah, yeah. like several years ago, so I don't <laughs> know what's the current like state of art. Yeah, but if they have it, yeah, it would be really nice if you have it. I, I'll check that. Thanks. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, in addition to this firm level intervention, we also had this uh, regional level intervention. So in 60% of the prefectures, we have not up to 95% of the firms being treated in one of those pollution appeal, 
interventions. And in 40% of the prefectures, we have only 70% of the firms being treated in one of those different arms. But ideally, we would like to have several additional tiers of intensity to back up the entire distribution. But here we have a trade-off of statistical power. We don't want to put too many firms in the control arm. So that's why we ended up with only two groups. But that still allows us to compare the control firms across the high versus low treatment intensity prefectures, which will identify the spillover effect from our interventions. OK, and the experiment started in May uh, 2020. It lasted for about eight months until the end uh, of 2020. So during this period, uh, we intervened against uh, 11,000 violations, which involved about 7,000 different uh, SIMS firms. And the main findings of this paper could really be realized in this one figure. So here, the outcome variable is the daily violation rate of the SIMS firms. And what we see is that if we make private pollution appeals against the SIMS firms, and no matter how we do it, you know, we message the government on Weibo, we message them on the website, we call the government or we call the firm. In all those cases, we just see a marginal reduction in the firm's pollution violation rate. But in contrast, if we make public pollution appeals against the firm using the exact same information, same format, same content, we actually see a much larger and much stronger reduction in the firm's violation rate. And in, count, uh, so, uh, in terms of magnitude, this result represents a 0.6 percentage point in the firm's daily violation rate, which is a 40% reduction from the very low baseline average violation rate. So in relative terms, this is a very large uh, treatment effect. And this uh, result on uh, emission violations can be corroborated by reductions in actual emissions from these firms. So if you look at air emissions as measured by SO2 and water emissions as measured by COD, so COD is a chemical oxygen demand, which is the main measure for water pollution uh, in the system. And so for both measures, we see the same pattern as before, but private appeals not uh, very effective, public appeals much more effective. And so in terms of magnitude, uh, we see a 13% drop in air emissions and a 4% drop in water emissions. Uh, yes. So, so that what's the time window uh, when you make the comparison? So uh, how quick does the firms respond to, to these appeals? Uh, so time you, by timing, you mean like, the, timing of which the, the time window, like, uh, so how many days you count as the baseline uh, in, uh, in, in comparison? And so uh, the second question is how quick? So like uh, um, after how many, generally after how many days uh, mm -hmm. do the firms respond to these uh, appeals? Yeah, no, so, so I think in this case, you know, these variables actually don't depend on timing because we're looking at you know, your average violation rate. So if you violate it today, it's one. If you didn't violate today, it's zero. So basically the treatment variable is not like varying at the day level, it's varies at the firm level. So basically for the first same firm throughout the eight months period, what's your daily violation rate? And you know, for the emission data, for this firm, if you're treated throughout the eight months period, what's your average emission concentration? So it doesn't depend on, you know, when you respond to, to my oh, specific I see. I see. So um, there's a no, uh, there's no, not a pre-post comparison, right? There's just a uh, cross firms. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the, the pre-post comes from, you know, before we start the experiment or after we start the experiment, but the experiment is, you know, defined based on intention to treat. Right? So it's, so after the May 6, 2020, whenever you commit a violation, I'm going to appeal against you. So that's how the intervention is defined. And so it doesn't depend on each specific appeal. It's really you're assigned to this arm. So after this day, you're always being treated by us. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, to understand the you know why publicity matters so much, you know, we have the cross randomization. You know, within the public Weibo appeals, we randomly add ten additional likes and retweets to the uh, a subset of those posts, and we see how the government responds differently to the randomly more visible, randomly less visible Weibo appeals. And we find that when a Weibo appeal randomly becomes more visible with additional likes and retweets, the government is significantly more likely to formally respond to that appeal. And conditional on responding, the government will write a more detailed response. And then conditional on responding, the government will be significantly more likely to conduct on-site investigations, trying to resolve 
the corresponding pollution violation. Right, so all these results point to the explanation that you know the government is exerting more efforts in response to uh, public pollution appeals uh, in the uh, regulation enforcement. And in the paper, we examined several other hypotheses, you know, but we find that they don't have such a strong explanatory power of the results as uh, this hypothesis does. And you know, finally, we tried to understand you know, what are the spillover effects from our experiment. And so to do this, we compare the control firms in the cities where very, a lot of the firms are treated and the control firms where very few other firms are treated. And what we find is that you know, if you're a firm in the high treatment intensity city, you're actually going to be marginally cleaner during the experimental period. So this means that you know, there is no negative spillover effect. So it's not like you know, the government is focusing on the appealed firms and you are off the hook, you can pollute as much as you want. But instead, if anything, you're becoming a little bit cleaner during this period, even if you know, your peers are being uh, appealed against and you're not being appealed against. So this means that you know, if anything, there's a very noisy but potentially positive spill effect. So if you appeal against a subset of firms, other firms might also get cleaner. So the, this is important because this means that if we further expand the scope of our interventions, the treatment effect is unlikely to diminish as we scale up. If anything, they might get uh, even larger as we scale things further up. And the final result we, we find in the paper, which is quite interesting is that, you know, we want to see whether our interventions can translate into aggregate pollution differences between the high intensity cities and the low intensity cities. So the idea is that, you know, to the extent that our interventions had huge effects on the SIMS firms, and to the extent that the SIMS firms account for more than 75% of the total emissions in China, you know, then in the, in the cities that we treated more firms uh, versus the cities that we treated fewer firms, we might be able to detect a meaningful difference in their ambient pollution levels during our experimental period. So we cannot do it for water pollution because for COD, more than half of the COD emission doesn't come from industrial production. So we don't have enough power there. But for SO2, we have a much more uh, powerful test because more than 80% of China's SO2 comes from uh, industrial production. And then, you know, by looking at SO2, we find a 3.7% difference. So the, 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 firm, the, the cities with more firms being treated, they have a 3.7% lower SO2 during our sample period compared to uh, the cities with fewer firms being treated. So this ambient pollution data is not coming from the SIEMS data, it's coming from the national air monitoring stations. So it's a totally different system. So this also means that you know, the baseline results cannot be explained by the manipulation of the SIEMS data because the results can also be detected in totally independent sources that have nothing to do with the SIEMS firms. Okay, so to very quickly conclude, so in the paper we found that public pollution appeals could significantly improve the enforcement of environmental standards. In contrast, pol private pollution appeals, even if using the same content and information, only have marginal impacts. And we found that publicity matters because it can make the government more responsive and exert more efforts in regulation enforcement. And we found that you know, our pollution appeals do not crowd out other regulatory efforts. If anything, it may be crowding in additional uh, regulatory efforts. And taken together, you know, we think encouraging more citizens to get involved in environmental governance could be a very cost-effective way to further improve environmental compliance, uh, at least in China. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Shouda, and this is fascinating and it's very well done. And let me now uh, have uh, Yixia to give her feedback. Thank you. So first, um, I want to thank Shouda and Angela for putting this together and for including me in the discussion. The paper that we just uh, heard focuses on environmental accountability, which is a core issue in China's environmental governance. Uh, for quantitative analysis, not my expertise, but I was really impressed by the scope of data and the depth of, of this research. Uh, to my knowledge, there aren't many national scale quant study about environmental accountability, and even fewer has used uh, experiments in this area. So I want to congratulate Shouda and, and your co-authors on finishing this fantastic project. This is something that I want to assign to my students to read, and that is, of course, with your permission. But as I, as I understand from uh, the organizer, from Angel, my role here is mainly to comment on the environmental and legal aspects of this paper. 
So environmental accountability has been considered as a major weakness in China's environmental law and its implementation. And there are main, two main obstacles. The first is competing policy goals, as you pointed out in the paper. One is pro-growth goals, and the other is environmental protection. And there is also a problem of lack of coordination among uh, local governments and also pr local protectionism, of course. Both are related to the central local dynamics in China. And in recent years, the central government has introduced more efforts to increase accountability of local governments in the environmental area. And that include top-down inspection campaigns and also an increased environmental in information transparency. But then there is also the argument that in the absence of an elective democracy to check the power of the local governments, transparency alone does not lead to increased accountability. And similarly, because of information asymmetry and collusion among local governments to hinder uh, the implementation of this top-down inspection efforts, the top-down efforts alone also cannot lead to increased accountability either. So I think the finding of this paper really offers new hope in this area of study that uh, there are uh, indeed some external pressure, especially combined efforts from the society, from the public, and also the media can play an important role in making a difference in holding local governments accountable in China. And it contributes to shaping this new direction of research on environmental accountability as well. In my, I have two major comments. Uh, one uh, is on the sort of conceptualization of issues in this paper. So it seemed to um, make an assumption that uh, the Chinese central government is more genuine in promoting environmental governance, whereas the local governments, they are uh, the, the, the bad agents, right? They, they are more pro-growth. So they, they tend to uh, deviate from the central objectives when they are monitored effectively. But I'm a little unsure about either the accuracy or the necessity of this assumption in this paper. So in the experiment, uh, remember from the paper that you try to isolate the influence of top-down pressure by adding a threat to report to the national government um, in the, those private appeals. And you find that this uh, threat uh, in private appeals doesn't have a significant Im impact on uh, the number of uh, the frequency of violation or the intervention from local governments. But in my view, this treatment in itself is not enough to isolate the influence of this top-down pressure or from the national government, because there are probably two or even more uh, possibilities, right? One is that the motivation for the national government to intervene is not mainly driven by the environmental damage per se, but it's also driven by the perception of the public response to the seriousness of the issue. Right? We have, um, for example, Alex Wan from UCLA, who argued that what the Chinese government care, really care about in the ongoing environmental campaign is not the uh, real world effectiveness of such campaign, but rather the public image. Uh, therefore, it's more about the symbolic legitimacy, right? It's not about uh, the performance legitimacy. And of course, it's also a common argument in contentious politics that government will allocate resources to resolve certain disputes based on the potential threat to political legitimacy or public discontent. So it's possible that the national government will also respond based on the public perception of the issue. And that is the reason why public appeals is more effective than private appeals. And the second possibility is that the top-down pressure may not come directly from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, as Angela also an, an alluded to in her comment, that um, there are other forces, top-down forces, especially the National Supervision Commission or the anti-corruption campaign. And in my own research, we found that uh, Chinese local administrative agencies, they are responsive to the intervention from procurators in public interest litigation, not because they are afraid of those procurators themselves, but they uh, uh, fear that the intervention from the procurator may trigger anti-corruption investigation. Because in nowadays, these environmental inspections, they are also intertwined with anti-corruption inspections as well. So um, in my uh, view, it's more likely uh, that the combination of this bottom up, the public appeals and some top down forces, meaning the fear of an intervention from higher level uh, governments that have contributed to an increasing accountability um, in, in, in this area. My second uh, question, and it's more of a question, open-ended question rather than comment, that it's, it's about the policy and social implications of this research. 
So in, in the law school, we've read a lot about uh, network justice in China. The scholars have written how uh, Chinese courts, especially in the area of criminal justice, have been more responsive to popular demands rather than uh, the, the principle of upholding uh, the consistent application of law. And that uh, in itself may undermine the legitimacy of judicial institutions and the consistency and predictability of, of, of law in the long term. So I wonder, uh, are there similar uh, concerns in, in this environmental accountability area that by um, advocating for encouraging public appeals through Weibo and other uh, uh, channels, will it undermine the existing efforts of institutionalization in China's environmental governance, especially the top-down campaigns and also on, uh, the, the, uh, the vertical management uh, structure in environmental advocacy, et cetera. And also on the practical side, um, because as you suggested that public appeals do make a difference, but does that mean that we should encourage uh, citizens to be engaged in those public appeals more systematically? And especially should we encourage Chinese environmental NGOs to engage in organizing citizens in this way? Because we've uh, realized that in other areas of law um, concerning human rights violations, that there is a political risk for Chinese NGOs to get involved in organizing sort of a public appeal through uh, Weibo and other uh, an internet, uh, mobilizing internet resources. And because you've collaborated extensively with an environmental NGO, I want to hear you to elaborate on this point. How do you evaluate the potential political risk from arising from this uh, approach? But again, uh, the, these are my main comments and uh, congratulations again on finishing this uh, fantastic project. Uh, Shada, before, I, I don't know whether you want to respond, but I really like Ying Xia's comments. And I actually have similar reaction to your paper because it seems to present a paradox here. Because the story that you're telling us is that, look, we can crowdsource uh, public uh, resources, public dissatisfaction to enable better governance in environmental law. However, during the presentation, we realized almost, <laughs> that you know these are the routine cases, right? I mean, these are not the cases where directly, you know, um, cause a lot of huge amount of dissatisfaction. So um, citizens in general in those low state cases have very little incentive to uh, participate, right? I mean, so your normatic implication is: look, we should uh, encourage more uh, public um, engagement. However, we have only seen these effects in those low stake and routine cases where you are unlikely to see and are very difficult to crowdsource uh, those uh, public because public are not incentivized to do that. However, in high stake cases where public you know, are greatly incentivized because you know, my home is, you know, my, my, pollute, my air was polluted. But in those cases, in the specific institutional context in China, those those blog posts you posted on, on Weibo will be immediately deleted, right? I mean, so you present a paradox here that it seems this kind of, you know, you know, very encouraging, this high magnitude effects that we observe only apply to cases that, you know, actually public um, participation is actually, you know, in real, realistically, uh, it is not quite feasible. Okay, no, so thanks a lot uh, for the comments and, you know, for the additional question. So let me give a very quick uh, response. So I, I really appreciated the comments. You know, it's it's very helpful, especially the comment on you know the role of central government here. We definitely need to you know, better think about this and articulate about this. But you know, a very quick response to the second comment uh, that both of you just mentioned. So I guess a quick quick response is that you know we're not inventing the wheel here. It's not like you know no one has done this appeals before and we just created something out of the blue. But actually, if you look at the, the universe of appeals received by the government, naturally they receive 600,000 such pollution appeals from citizens, NGOs, you know, all over the place. But most of them are private, they're not public, but they, they receive a lot of those. And actually a lot of them, they're like at least three or four NGOs. They're doing public appeals on Weibo, exactly what we have been doing. And we were actually inspired by them. We saw their appeals and we wonder, you know, whether this would work. But they didn't do it randomly, they were localized. So we thought, you know, if we create this additional random variation at the national level, we may be able to understand, you know, how and why this works. So that was the motivation. But you're absolutely correct that, you know, in general, for these low state cases, there are very low 
participation that naturally occur. And that's actually a puzzle not specific to this paper, but in this entire literature, the citizens don't want to get involved in this stuff, even if there's a very clear benefit. So although you call this a uh, low state case, but if you look at the amount of uh, violation, so how much they're exceeding the national standard, so our calculation suggests that you know if just for the state today low stake violations, if you can bring their emission below the national standard, then actually you reduce the total emission level by more than thirty percent. So there's actually a big return to reducing this you know day to day low stake and you know not so sensitive uh, violations. And you know we think this is really a low hanging fruit in this entire uh, regulation process. And actually we are trying to work on a uh, follow-up experiment where we try to use different ways to nudge people or encourage people to spontaneously get participated in environmental governance. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes, but you know we're thinking along the directions that, that you were suggesting. Uh, John, your turn. Yeah, um, so I like the paper a lot. It's very fascinating. Uh, the, the national wide experiment is so cool. Um, so uh, let me give some comments, uh, actually, actually, uh, actually questions. So uh, first comments on the, uh, also on the implication. So, so I, when I read the paper, I keep asking myself, what, what do we learn from the paper, right? It's, it's like, if you push the local government harder, it will be more responsive to the citizens. But that, that sounds not really new to, uh, to the students of Chinese political economy, right? So, uh, and what actually inspired me a lot is the spillover effect, right? Uh, you, uh, the way you find is that there's no spill. So basically uh, for, the gener uh, for the general equilibrium, this, even you nudge the government harder, it will not focus. So in general, they will improve their responsiveness rather than they focus on a bunch of cases that you nudge them, right? So this is very interesting. And then, um, but what I wonder is that what, what about the long-term effect, right? So now you can nudge the government to be more responsive, but what about as a petitioner, as Yingxia and Angela said, so NGO can decide strategies to, uh, to nudge the government to be more responsive. But what about we, we actually have an NGO, like you can start an NGO to do this, right? So to monitor the government every day and nudge and post uh, those uh, violation on, on, on Weibo. Well, the, what about the long run, right? In the long run, will the government be so responsive as well? So this is another type of general equilibrium effect as well, or, or also spillover effect as well. And relevantly, uh, is the um, the focus of the government might might be diverted to environmental protection, but actually, there's as every government has limited resources, right? You you, you spend more time on uh, environmental protection, while well, there may be less time doing other things, right? So um, Again, this is about the general implication, right? What can, what can we actually do to, uh, to nudge the government and whether this is feasible in the long run, all right? Um, uh, this is about the general uh, theory or general implication. So some question regarding the, um, the design, the experimental design, which is also related to the, the top-down and bottom-up um, approach of this environmental monitoring. I wonder when you decide the experiment, have you considered like randomizing the um, the reporting bureau? Like some in some cases you can report to the provincial level government. In some cases you can report to the central government. In some cases you can report to local government, right? So and that will help answer the question about uh, whether it is a top down approach or it is really a bottom up approach to uh, environmental protection. Which which one is more effective, right? So um, also, as I asked, so uh, the incentive or uh, uh, the intensity of private appeals might matter, but you answer that question. Um, so, and uh, what, what is actually realistic in, in, in real practice for environmental NGO is to do both private approach, which is report a case to government uh, and all, uh, plus public approach, which is um, post the uh, post the violation on Weibo, right? I, I don't know whether um, so. I wonder why, whether you you consider trying this uh, T one treatment one plus treatment two effect and, and see whether there's any marginal effect of, of these two, right? And this is realistic approach, right? This is 
if I want to start an NGO to improve this area, I would definitely do that, right? Uh, so this is about uh, experiment design and some question about data analysis. Um, so Angela asked the, the type of firms, listed companies and uh, listed firms and private firms. So I also wonder whether uh, state-owned enterprises and uh, non-state-owned enterprises has any different in the response in it, in this case. And also, um, uh, and other things, regional variations. So private treatment might work some, that does tr private treatment work someplace other than other place. So there might be some uh, regional variation of the responsiveness, responsiveness of the government and why that is the case, right? So uh, if some government, some local government are more responsive, why? So probably, probably checking the interaction between like response rates or uh, responses, responsiveness and whatever index you have on the prefecture or provincial level might be a good idea. Right? GDP per capita, the level of corruption, the level of rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I think that those are my comments. Thank you very much, John. Um, I have one additional um, suggestion for this paper, because the story that I heard um, so far is actually not that um, you know public participation will make the government uh, more accountable to the people. It is the opposite. It is to make the people the government more accountable upstairs, because at the end of the day, it's it. This is a principal agent story here, that the these agencies are not really responding to the public. Um, you know, if they were responding to the public, they would have responded to those private appeals, which he didn't see any effect. Whereas they are responding to the publicity, right? So they're worried the publicity may bring trouble to their own bureaucracy bureaucracy, right, to their own career, uh, anything might bring in anti-corruption uh, investigation, right? And so it's to increase accountability upstairs, <laughs> not to the public. Um, um, we have a few uh, questions from the audience. Let me start with uh, Marianne uh, Bloomberg. Um, Did you encounter the trust breaker rhetoric or social credit blacklist in your research? I'm curious about the use of shaming, not only by private, but also by regulators themselves. I'm not 100% sure uh, about this question, maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe. So, so basically like in throughout our experiment, nothing got like deleted or censored and we were anything like that. Those like, so this also relates to John's question actually, you know, why we chose these specific arms, but not, not some other potential arms, because all the arms that we used in this experiment are the types of appeals that are explicitly encouraged by the government. So we follow their playbook. So why we filed the appeal to the local regulator, but not the provincial government or the central government, because this was the suggested route of appeal. So we were basically, you know, played by their playbook, but we found that, you know, the only, you know, useful ways to do it publicly. And also, let me very quickly respond to what Angela asked about, you know, the, the, whether they're responding to the upper level government or responding to the people. I think the question is about, you know, whether it's about their intrinsic motivation or it's about the result. And what we observe is that the result is that, you know, they're doing what the people want, as is they're making the environment better. But whether that's because they want to serve the people or want, they want to, you know, serve the, the, uh, the, the upper level government, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a very subjective question, but you know, from an economics perspective, we care about the, the revealed preference, which is you know what you end up doing is that you know you're making uh, the firms pollute less. So, so we're talking about you know in terms of the uh, policy result, they're serving the people, but you know they may be you know doing that because they want to serve the upper level government. But I guess you you through some uh, uh, through some tests, you might be able to figure out whether there's responding upstairs, right? I mean. Uh, yes, so I think right. you know through additional interventions, we may be able to unravel the black box of their incentives and to see you know, exactly what their you know utility function looks like. It, yeah, it will be very exciting if we can we can do that. Right. And are there are yeah. there any provinces that are more responsive than the others? Like even private treatment can can actually make an effect there. Yeah, so there are places that are, you know, so, so we try to plot 
So inside in the paper, but we try to plot the average treatment effect by province. We can see you know, heterogeneities, but we haven't found the right stratified effect variable to categorize that heterogeneity. And so we see some provinces are more responsible than others, but we don't know what's the underlying determinant of that heterogeneity, but we, we're, we're thinking about that. And you know, corruption may be one thing that, that was mentioned. So we'll, we'll give it to a try, but yeah. Uh, another audience asks, what will be the consequence when a firm uh, violates this emission standard? Would they, would they say lose the operating license or what else? Yeah, so basically you know, that's, that's an important question. So basically, in this case, if they violate the emission standard, but the government doesn't do anything about it, then you know, there is no consequence. And if you know, we file the appeal and the government conducts an on-site investigation, then the government can issue a warning and, and a fine to the firm. And then you know, in the following months, the government can conduct a second unannounced random audit. And if the second audit again finds the firm to be violating the emission standard, then the government can shut down the firm for a certain period of time. Right? So it really depends on, you know, first, whether the government conducts the first action, which is what we try to trigger with our interventions, and then conditional on the government conducts the first visit and you know, whether the firm changes its behavior or not, you know, that's, that depends on how the firm responds to the government. Have you collected data on how the government has responded to either private or public appeals in, in, in real world, not just respond to these appeals themselves, but whether the government has paid more uh, additional inspections or penalty, imposed penalties on those enterprises, or is that just a perceived threat of government inter intervention would suffice for the firm to? Yeah, so we, we have the data on all the funds issued by the government on the firms. But as you mentioned, you know, it's complicated because it's, a, it's two effects. One is a deterrence effect. And if the government says, you know, if you don't do anything, I'm going to punish you. On the equilibrium pass, the firm just should stop polluting. And then, so only in the off equilibrium pass will the firm get punished. So, you know, there are two forces working against each other. And in the end, we didn't find the funds to vary across any of these arms, but it could be, you know, these two forces are working against each other. Excellent. So um, uh, this, this webinar is actually coming to an end. We're running out of time. And I greatly enjoy the discussion with Xiaoda and um, thank our uh, discussants, uh, Yixia and John Liu for excellent comment and feedback. Um, and I thank the audience for uh, joining us and I will see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Yeah.